Okay. So getting into Sicily. All right. Uh, let's see, where was I? Oh yeah, we were. Uh, so we went back out to sea, and eventually, the, well, we sat out there, went back and forth, just going around and around in circles, because they were waiting for the landing. They had already the Allies had landed in in southern Italy, and they were moving north, and uh, so pretty soon they they'd taken Naples. And so we moved into Naples Bay, and we were scheduled to, to be quite a while before we were unloaded. And then they found out that we had uh, anti-aircraft equipment, so we were shoved in immediately into the uh, into port. Well, when we got into port, it looked like there was a bunch of ships in there, but they were all just hulls because the American bombers had had done a job on the German and Italian shipping industry, and all the ports had sunken ships in them, all the docks. So they they run us in there and they took a an LST and they loaded the, our cargo because we couldn't we had no place to dock. What they did, they went out and dropped the anchor out at the bow of the ship. And then they took a winch and winched us back to the shore, and in other words, held the ship like it between two, two strings. And so they ran this LST alongside, and they loaded the stuff down onto the, on the LST, and run the elevator down, and then they could drive it off, off, off the bottom of the. That's the way they unloaded the ship. But they got down to our, the truck that I was, I had, and they had our big power plant trucks down in both holes in the aft and stern of the ship. And we were up in the, in the number, I guess probably number two hatched, way down in the very bottom of the, of the cargo hatch. And, but they, they couldn't unload us onto the LSTs because they were too heavy. Uh, so they had a they had floated in uh, a dock, or I called it a dock. It was a bunch of pontoons tied together, and then pushed up against the shore, and they tied it to the ship and unloaded these big trucks onto that and drove them off. But it was only long enough, long enough to reach to the to the. Uh, uh, what do I want to call it on the ship? Uh, where the officers are, you know, I mean, where the wheelhouse and that is in the ship, the midship. That's as far as it, it would reach. Well, we were up in the forward holes, and they, so there was no way to get us out. Well, they had moved all the ships, everything else out, and taken our, our people that had been on there, had gone and took the rations and everything with them, weren't getting hungry. <laughs> But anyway, it was a nice day, and, and three of us were uh, uh, decided to go down onto the onto the dock. We went down on the dock. We're sitting there in the sun, and and uh, all of a sudden, a jeep comes up with a flag on the front of it, two stars on the flag, and so we jump up and give him a highball, and and. Uh, he said, what are you GIs doing out here? And so the other guys kind of moused off. They were scared. To, that scared them to death. And they don't scare me. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, we're waiting to, to unload our equipment. I said, we're on the, our power plants on the, on the ship. He said, what outfit are you with? And I said, well, 351st anti-aircraft. He said, well, God, we need that anti-aircraft equipment. How come it isn't being unloaded? I said, well, I said, nobody will listen. That's one reason why. He said, what do you mean nobody will listen? And I said, well, I said, they got all the equipment off of the stern of the ship onto that dock out there. But I said, they, they couldn't unload us on the LSTs because these power plants are too heavy. But I said, I told the, talked to the officer on, on the dock crew. 
I said, why don't you move that pontoon? I said, hell, it floats, and tie it off to the front and load a couple uh, power plants on it and bring it in and unload them and go back. It seems like a simple operation to me. And the general says, well, what did he say? He said, go mind your own goddamn business. He said, oh, fine. He said, well, he said, we need you guys. Well, pretty soon I'm up on deck and there I see them there moving the pontoons. <laughs> so <coughs> they get ready and I see the the officer standing there scratching his head and he's looking down in, in the hole and here they, we had uh, eight big trucks, these big uh, trucks, they got a van on them and each one was a power plant. They're sitting down in there back to, back to back. We had two of them this way and then four of them, four and a half in the hole. So he's sitting there scratching his head and, and I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, we're trying to figure out how to get those trucks out of there. I said, well, I said, I know how to get them out. He said, what do you mean you know how to get them out? I said, well, I said, you see those big planks down there? Those big timbers? Yeah. I said, well, they were put in there when these were in Oran. And he said, well, what do you know about unloading it? I said, well, I said, it ought to unload the same way it was loaded. I said, I was here when they loaded it. Oh, well, he said, how'd they do it? I said, well, if you'll take that, that truck over there and drive it right over as far as it'll go, then I said, back this other one back up to it, then take those big timbers and put them down in front of the wheels, front wheels on that truck, and drive it up onto the bilge tanks. Then I said, you can back that other truck out. And I said, when it comes back, It'll be right over where those cargo nets, you see those cargo nets down there? I said, they'll be right on top of those cargo nets, right where they, because mm. the guys couldn't get them out when they loaded the ship, so they left them on the damn ship. Oh, so he got a hold of the sergeant. He said, well, that's the way you do it, sergeant. So he said, well, who can drive those trucks? I said, well, all of us can. We got all the drivers. So we got the three of us down there and load, fired these trucks up. and. And so pretty soon they, they got it unloaded or started to get unloaded. So we got, they got ready to unload my, my truck, which was the second one out. Well, I guess it was before that, the first one, and they had a, what they call a jumbo block, where there's some multiple lines, you know, uh, three shivs on each, and you line, and Instead of being like uh, big cranes with a big heavy hook on it, they were just blocks with just a small lightweight hook on it. And the, the operator was sitting there and he was trying to get the, this pin to go down so they could pin it to the, the shackles down there where the, they had the trucks ready to lift out and it wouldn't go down. And he's sitting there fussing with his sergeant. I said, hell, what's the matter with you guys? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, it's kind of simple, isn't it? To, if it, that block isn't heavy enough to drag that old, all that line down, why don't you just drop the boom down and hook onto something down there and then raise the boom up and let out on the load line? And, and I said, keep doing that until you get the damn block down to where you want it. And he said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, I says, I hollered at the operator. I said, okay, boom down. So he did, and now I said, okay, now uh, tell the rigger to tie that off to the something down there on the ship. Now I says, boom up and let down on your load line. And pretty soon and we had, they had us unloaded. They had me unloaded and a couple others. I, under, I heard afterwards that what had happened was that the, the block had got froze up because they hadn't greased it properly and it ruined the block. They tore it up doing that, <coughs> but that wasn't my my problem. But we sat there in Naples, oh, for a long time. In fact, I was in Naples when Vesuvius blew its top. In fact, I was out one day with a truck getting something or other. I was always out. They always anybody to drive a truck, I 
getting supplies because we always had to have gasoline and, and water and what have you. I mean, water for the mess hall, gasoline for the power plants because the searchlights had a power plant and the radar had a power plant. So it took a lot of gas and what have you to keep these things running. But we got, uh, uh, while we were there, uh, anyway, I'd been out someplace going after supplies. And I, I was coming up the hill and I, I stopped and, and looked out and I thought, God, Vesuvius is making a lot of fuss today because it sat there and kept spewing out fire out to the top of it. it. had this big cone in the middle. And while I was watching it, it exploded and that cone and all just disappeared in a big cloud, mushroom cloud, went up and of course lava come down through the side uh, and uh, buried one of the Air Force uh, with the B-25s in ash. And there was about a hundred of them in there. They dug them out, but they never did fly again because they had ash in all the engines and what have you. Wow. But, uh, and then one day I got uh, a pass to go out and I went up to where the lava was and I walked out across this, where the lava had come down into this town. And the, the head guides out there were showing people around the natives. And he took a piece of paper and he said, here, we're standing up on this thing. There's a little crack and he stuck the paper down in there and it lit because it's still red hot down. And we're standing on top of this. Uh. But uh, after we left Naples, uh, the war finally progressed and, and uh, they sent us, uh, let's see, where did we go from there? We went up to uh, Florence, I guess, outside of Florence on the river. And they had, because by that time we'd been in Naples for quite a while, nine, t nine ten months, something like that. And one of the nice things about being in Naples was that in the spring of the year, they come around to issue us overcoats. And so they were nice. You could put them on your bed as an extra blanket. Then in the fall, they come around and collect them all up again to give them to the infantry because they'd lost theirs. So then we had the winter without them. All in the hot summer, we had overcoats. In the wintertime, didn't have any. I had another funny experience happen to me. Uh, we kind of paired up, you know, his buddy system. And I had a, a guy that was a big, tall, lanky fellow from Nebraska. And he was, his dad was a rancher in Nebraska. And all through Africa and clear up into Naples, and we'd been up in Naples quite a while. And we had, as I said, we had four or five people in the outfit spoke German. And so they, every once in a while, they'd get to jabbering the German amongst themselves, you know. So we're sitting there in the mess, mess tent one day, and I knew by the, just the tone and the laughing that was going on, and, they were making fun of my buddy and myself. And so this buddy of mine, he's a big guy. So everything went along fine. And all of a sudden he stood up and he reached across the table, he grabbed two of them by the arm and banged their heads together. And then he started to tell them in German what he thought of them. Nobody knew that he spoke German. He was German too, his German descent. The rest of them just disappeared out through the tent. They were gone. We didn't have any more trouble after that. But uh, after we left Naples, we, they had taken the searchlights and by uh, moving the, the arc, they were arc lights, and by moving the arc away from the focal point, of the polished mirror in the back. 
well, instead of having a beam out, it went out in a fan. And then, so they set us up like on river crossings because the Germans were strafing uh, the river crossings and places like that to kind of uh, stop some, give the, the, you know, your 50 caliber machine guns a chance at shooting some of these guys down. And so we tried that, but the, that didn't last very long. The Germans ran out of gasoline. But uh, we were having trouble in northern Italy because in the winter time, all that winter of rain, it's a wet country, about like our Cascades, but because it's uh, farms and what have you, it's muddy all the time because all the GI trucks and so the roads were a slimy mess. So somebody got a bright idea that they would use our searchlights for moonlight. And so our outfit, our battery was, this, was picked to be the experiment with this thing to see whether it would work. And what we would do, we set up and it, it would get a road that went along Say it'd be crooked, all right, you know what I mean. But it, if you looked on a map, well, it'd be a kind of a straight line for maybe 10, 15 miles. And we would set up where the bend was with a searchlight, and then shine it into the clouds because it's always cloudy and dark. And then it would re reflect down just like moonlight. And when we we did that, the convoys move stuff up to the front instead of going five miles an hour in blackout, could travel at 25 miles an hour in moonlight. So that was great. But everybody was worried about what's going to happen, you know, with all these lights out there. So they moved some of us up forward, and we set up in place and just back of the line. And in fact, we were sitting up there, and. and MP come along and he said, what the heck are you guys doing? Well, we're setting up these searchlights. Searchlights? Not up here you're going to get searchlights. Yeah, we got orders to set them up up here. He said, well, you better find a hole because somebody's going to be shooting at you. <laughs> but he said, I guess if that's the order, so that's what you'll do. So anyhow, we had been given orders that the, the infantry, there was a hill out ahead of where we were stationed, and the Allies wanted to take the top of that hill to get the high ground. And so they had planned for an attack, a night attack on this hill. So we were given orders to, to shine our lights at the top of that hill or near the top of it on the clouds, and that the infantry then would would make an attack on that hill in the, at night. And because nobody knew for sure what was going to happen, we were supposed to have them on for just two hours and then shut the lights off. So we did. And as soon as we did that, as soon as the lights went out, the infantry guys started screaming, what happened? What happened to the moon? And so, of course, some of their officers had been told that this was going to be an experiment. And so they, their, their boys started getting confused and they said, turn the lights back on. Well, they, we had no communications with the infantry. They had to go clear back to Rome to Fifth Army Headquarters and get Fifth Army Headquarters to tell us to get up and out of bed and turn the lights back on so they could finish the attack. So you know how that, how that <coughs> goes. But we were close enough to the front that we had one of our lights was bombed out with mortar shells, so you know we weren't very far back. It's kind of say you're a pretty good target. Yeah, you know, but uh, they were all worried about planes shooting at us. You know, I mean, but a plane can't shoot at a, a searchlight. Uh, he gets blinded, and he either has to undershoot or overshoot. So we didn't have any problem with planes shooting at them. Just mortars. But uh, 
Then they decided to break our outfit up after we'd gone to all this trouble. They took our lights away from us and gave them to the engineers. And I heard that the engineers burned up three lights right after they got them because the, these, arc, these arc lights, they, we used to have a, a sight that you could watch the arc and they moved in and out and you, you had to keep, there was an automatic device to keep them in the center but sometimes it would screw up and, and then somebody had to adjust them. And if you weren't careful, then the darn arc would move back and burn into the into the mirror. But they'd lost three of them before they got very far. But they set us up, and oh, we were in camp for a while, and I and just sitting around. And this is one of my big beefs with with the army was. Uh, 90 day wonders and we had one he got to be first lieutenant but I don't know how the hell he did got that far to be honest with you but we were sitting there and they were giving us training we were going to be assigned to the infantry see the coast artillery is reserve infantry and so they were getting us trained for that so we sat there in this uh, Lieutenant came out, and he was a platoon officer. So he's given us a lecture one day on uh, spotting your position on a map using an Allidade method. So he, he's telling us how to do this, and, and I'm looking at him, and he, I'm describing this thing. And I said, "Now wait a minute. I mean, I just got through." taken engineering and the last class I'd had was survey, this isn't going to, this doesn't wash what's going on. So I thought, well, I'll be polite. So I asked him, I said, Lieutenant, there's something wrong here someplace. I said, because I can get, with your method, I said, I laid this paper down on the desk and, and I said, oh, I said, I can have your method, I can be on this paper here or here or here or here. No, he said, that's, you do just like I tell you, and it's right. And he said, I know it's right. And so we argued, and I finally, because I'm thinking, look, this is my buddy's life out there, because we're supposed to be telling him how to spot our position so the artillery won't shoot or won't land on us, see? And I think, gosh, this guy's giving us the wrong scoop. Something's wrong here someplace. So anyhow... He argued, we argued back and forth until it's time to dismiss. And I was temporarily in the office helping the clerk in the office. So I'm sitting there at the typewriter. And this officer was in the back and he came back out. And he said, you know, he said, the Army doesn't make any mistakes. That What I was telling you is in the manual. And he, he, he said, here's the manual. He flopped it down on my desk in front of me. And he said, you read that. So I read it, and I said, wait a minute, Lieutenant. I said, you didn't tell us this part up here in italics. He said, well, that italics don't mean anything. And he said that, the, the captain came out of the back room, and he was an engineer in civilian life. He said, what do you mean it doesn't mean anything? He said, what are you guys arguing about anyway? And so I said, well, I, I said, uh, I." I told the lieutenant that this up here in the italics says you've got to orient the map before you start this project. <laughs> and he says that doesn't mean anything. And I said, hell, that's the most important thing in the whole thing. <laughs> and the captain says, of course it's important, you damn fool. <laughs> but we had a lot of those people like that that were uh, first and second lieutenants. Fresh out of a... Uh fresh over and, and young and thought they knew everything. Yeah. And you couldn't tell them anything. They wouldn't listen. <coughs> In fact, I had, when we, when we left there, we went back to a replacement depot in Naples and took retraining. And while I was there, we had a training exercise. You always had to march 10 miles for you took the lesson, you know what I mean? You couldn't, have, you couldn't have it in camp, you had to go someplace. But they were, 
the, the day, the object was to, to how to set up foxholes. So okay, it had been miserable weather and it had to be a nice sunny day. So we got out and, and okay, the position was that we we're setting up a position with the river right here in front of us. So I sat down there and I, and we were, had to dig a hole, a foxhole, so I dug what, what commonly called a slit trench, but what most of us figured over there were foxholes. So I dug one about so deep and threw the dirt up on the on the windward side and I laid down in there and pulled my helmet over my hat and I felt something kind of a queer feeling and I looked up and there was those two bars shining all on the shoulder and so I jumped up and gave him a highball and he, he said, soldier, he said, what's, what's this project? And I said, well, it's, you know, a foxhole and we're defending this position over here. He says, do you call that a foxhole? And I said, well, it's not quite as deep as it'd be if I was up at the front, but I couldn't see any point digging a three-foot hole out here. And I just happened to look up, and there was a first lieutenant standing just over, listening to this conversation. And he had been an infantry officer that had stepped on a shoe mine and had his heel broken. And, and he was on limited duty, so he was back there in the training. So he'd been up to the front. So anyhow, this, this lieutenant said, well, he said, that's not a foxhole. And I said, well, I said, it looked like a foxhole as far as I could see. And he said, well, I'll tell you, he said, a foxhole is 30 inches by 20 inches by 24 inches deep. And I looked at my size and I said, 30 by 20 by 24 for a foxhole? <laughs> and, and I said, I don't know, Lieutenant. I said, I, I said, I've been all through North Africa and I've been up to the front lines in Italy. And I said, I've been in foxholes that R.G. Eisen's dug. I've been in dug some myself. And I said, I've been in some the Germans have dug. And I haven't seen anything like you described. He said, well, that's the latest thing from Fort Benning. And here he is, his all bright, nice, shiny new uniform, you know. And I said, well, it might be good in Fort Benning, but it, it sure isn't worth a damn in Italy. <laughs> and I looked at this other officer, and he had to turn his back. He was laughing so hard. <laughs> did, uh, did you ever experience any of the camouflage toilet paper? Oh yeah, we had that all the time. Little rolls, little packs like that. Come with the sea rations. Yeah, yeah. I heard the ink didn't stick very well to it. Yeah, and then we got rolled toilet paper too. We we always had a joke about that. This come out in rolls and every every sheet was stamped government property on it. We said that was one of the four F's that had that job of stamping the sheets. <laughs> it's interesting what war does. You know? Yeah. Oh, we had, but uh, after after that, I guess I must have carried a rabbit's foot with me because I always lucked out considering everything else. We finished our training there, and they sent us up to a replacement depot farther up. And I had been a barber in the three C's, and I had clippers and what have you, and when I could get power, I used to cut guys' hair, but uh, we got up uh, and by this time, well, we were in camp and, and I got this same problem I'd had on the ship I, and that was kind of a reoccurring problem with me. So I went down to get a brown bomber to take care of it. And, oh, no, we don't think so. You, maybe you got appendicitis. It kept, and all I had was a gut ache, you know. But, so anyhow, they, they throw me in the hospital. And the, the doctor down there, he says, oh, you haven't got appendicitis. I said, I know. He said, oh, you're gold bricking. I said, now, wait a minute, doc. <laughs> I, I said, I, I didn't 
come down here by myself. I says that uh, lieutenant medical officer in our outfit sent me down here. Yeah, well, okay. Well, he said, well, we better check. So I, I stayed in that hospital for a week. And so when I got back to the replacement depot where, where we'd been billings, the rest of the guys that, out of my outfit had shipped out to France. They'd gone into southern France. They had landed. They had that landing in southern France. So they went up there as replacements in that organization. They went through France. And a couple of my buddies ended up in the Battle of the Bulge. But I stayed in Italy. And shortly after I got back camp, I set up a barber shop and I was cutting hair and what have you. And of course, officers again come in and had to have a haircut, so okay. And so I cut his hair for him and he says, come on, now you're going to shave around the ears? I said, no, I can't shave you. I said, it's against the law. He said, what do you mean it's against the law? I said, I don't have any sterilizers for, for shaving equipment. I said, you get a nick? And I said, it, it's illegal. He says, soldier, he said, I told you to shave my ears, my neck. I said, okay, so I shaved his damn neck for him with a dull razor. <laughs> but shortly after that, I got called out and I was sent to the 10th Mountain Infantry. And so they sent us up on the line. And, and when we got up into the camp and we got organized, I, I went up to the uh, captain one day and I, I said, hey, how about getting leave to go home? He, he laughed at me. He said, what do you mean leave to go home? I said, yeah. I said, they got a program out now that will allow uh, people that had long enough time over overseas can have a leave to go back with transportation available and have uh, six weeks at home. And because we were pretty up in northern Italy, we were clear up. And so he said, I don't think so. But he said, let me look into it. So a day later, he said, by God, he said, you're right. They do have that program. And he says, uh, you've got time enough. I put your name in. I said, thank you. So in the meantime, we shipped out. We shoved off. And we... Uh, we went up and we were going to cross the Po River. We got up to get uh, crossing the Po River and, and uh, we were sitting there on the bank and, and all of a sudden the Germans opened up with the 88s behind us and they had, they were using the aircraft guns and they had lowered them to use them like artillery. And they had cut the fuses on their artillery, sh on their anti-aircraft shells, and they had had really plotted it well, because they burst right over the river. And here we are ready to cross that damn river. And I thought, oh hell, that's going to be, we'll be caught right in the middle of that shrapnel. And I heard a buzz behind me, and I looked up, and there was a, a lone P-47, one of those big, pursuit jobs, you know, with a big radial engine. And I looked up and I, I see him coming and a few minutes, you know, a few seconds later, well, here's a dozen more of them right behind him, a whole squadron of them. And that poor devil, he'd opened up with that 88, made a muzzle flash and I, I noticed those P-40, 40s dive off and a couple big blasts. We never heard any more out of him. We crossed the river and got out, moved on out of there then. But we moved up on the front line and we were, we, I was bunked with a sergeant. The Army found out that you couldn't put an individual man in a foxhole. They'd go stir crazy. You put two of you together and it kept you kind of uh, especially guys that were a little ner more nervous than others. Well, I, I drew us the platoon sergeant as my buddy in the foxhole. So we had 
we'd gone in to relieve another outfit on the line, and this they had this was a real nice foxhole. It was about five five feet deep, and it they had put lumber across it and piled dirt on the top of it, so there was only a narrow opening to get into it. And we got down in there, and but we were sitting in there one day. We decided to have a house cleaning because it was kind of a stalemate. And so we had a, a, a ration box and we'd put some spare rations in it and we'd got some 10 and one rations and that has all kinds of goodies mm -hmm. in it. And uh, uh, one of the things was a, a little t can of condensed milk and we'd punch two holes in to use some of the milk. And I had got a box from home. My mother worked for Rogers Candy Company, and she sent me a box of chocolates, and she dropped every one of them in double cellophane. And I'd got, this had finally got caught up to me. In fact, I got three boxes at once. <laughs> but anyway, I had this box of candy in this big ration box, and we'd covered it with a shelter half, and he'd laid his rifle on top of the shelter half while we were cleaning out the hole. A mortar shell came in and hit next to our hole, blew up, and we looked around, the shelter half was still there, and everything looked normal, a couple holes in the box. But when we, the sergeant got his rifle down, he said, oh, he said, good, they didn't get my rifle, but he couldn't open the breech because uh, the M1 was gas operated and it had collapsed the, the uh, chamber or the barrel for the uh, piston so the, the breech wouldn't open, so it was defunct. We got that, I got that can of milk out and it was plugged solid with dirt. It was just full of dirt, those two, those two little holes. I got that candy out and every piece of that had sand in it through the double wrap from the explosion. And the next day, we got some PX rations come up. And I mean, every once in a while, in stalemate operations. And of all the things they had in it, they had two bottles of beer for each man. Now you can imagine, Frontline had never been heard of before. <laughs> so. We had a runner who was a very religious kid. And uh, so I said to Sergeant, hey, I said, he, uh, he wouldn't drink beer if he was dying of thirst. So I took a handful of stale candy bars I got in my rations. I'm going down to see if I can trade him for this candy bar for, for some of his beer. So I went down there and I'm sitting in the hole and, my, and uh, he, yeah, we'd made a deal. He'd, Traded two bottles of beer for. So anyhow, I looked at my watch and I said, "Gee, it's just about ten o'clock. About time for Jerry to wake us up, because every morning at ten o'clock you could set your watch by it." He threw in a half a dozen mortar shells. So I stood up and started to go back to my own foxhole, and I reached down with my left hand and picked these two bottles of beer up. And just as I stood up, a mortar shell hit about, oh, maybe 15, 20 yards from me. And I felt something, I looked down and I was bleeding. So I rushed up, jumped into my foxhole, and the sergeant said, get in here. And so I got down and I said, hey, sergeant, give me your first aid pack. And he says, well, I can't find it. He said, what do you want that for? I said, well, give me my cartridge belt. I'll get my first aid pack out of it. He said, what for? I said, never mind what for, just give it to me. And then he looked down and I had blood down my leg and my pants were torn. And so he thought I'd get hit in the leg. So he started hollering, medic. And uh, there was another kid hit and he was hollering, the medics were up here. I said, hey, leave the damn medic alone till this guy gets through. I said, they'll quit dropping these in in a few minutes and it'll be quiet. And then I'll go down to CP and and I said, I, there's nothing wrong with me, I just got a broke finger. So anyway, I go down. I went down to the CP and 
And this other kid, they loaded him on a stretcher and they were taking him back. He got hit in the leg with the same shell. And, and a mortar shell makes a clover loof pattern when it explodes of shrapnel. It kind of goes out in a bunch. And I was just, where I was standing was in between in the, in the dead spots. So as I say, I had a rabbit's foot in my but uh, anyway, I, so I, I went back down to the CP and the, the aid man said, he says, can you catch those guys? He says, down the hill? He says, why don't you go back down to the, uh, the aid station and get that dressed properly? I said, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I said, let me get my shaving gear and I said, I get a chance to wash for a change. And so I, I rushed down, I caught up to the rest of the the crew, and I got down to the aid station, and they had us lined up where the guys coming in that had been little dings here and there. And, and the doc come down the line, and ouch. He said, uh, he looked at me, he said, what's the problem? I said, oh, I, said, I got a little scratch in my finger. I said, this kid over here, he's moaning like the devil. I said, he, he's, he's hurt, better take care of him. He said, never mind him. He says, I know him, he's just crying. <laughs> and he said, does that finger hurt? And I said, yeah, it hurts. He said, well, let me rephrase that. He says, does it ache like a toothache? I said, yeah, that's a better description. He said, I thought it might. He said, I think we've got a piece of the bone out of that. Now, he, he said, I'm going to send you back to the hospital. Is it for that little scratch? He said, yeah, he said, that's your trigger finger. And he says, they, they use human manure here for fertilizer. And he says, we don't want you to get an infection. You'd lose a hand. So he says, would you go back to the replacement depot? And so he gave me a shot of morphine and put a tagger on my neck and put me and loaded me in an ambulance. And I ended up in a, in a hospital further back and they put me in a bed. And pretty soon they come along and they, they took me into the operating room and, and the doc in there looked at it and he trimmed it all good and took an x-ray and he said, yeah, he said, they're right, they did take the end of that bone out, all right. So he dressed it and uh, because they'd give me some more morphine and, and they got an a Italian aide, uh, they were local people that the army had hired as uh, stretcher bearers. So two of them loaded me on a stretcher and took me back to my tent and they were trying to put me in the wrong bed. And I said, hey, I said, you dummy, it's over there. And they, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, I'll forget it. And I got off of the stretcher and walked over and the nurse jumped up and she, she said, don't you do get up like that. And I said, well, they're putting me in the wrong place. So she gave me help. But then they loaded me in a truck and sent me back to a, to a rest center. And it had been a, a, a resort town and it had these big hotels and we three of us had a room in this hotel and except we had to report for sick call, they gave us ration tickets and they, they had set up, because it was a rest center, they had set up mess halls in various places, all you had to do was show your ticket and you go in and get eats. So we had the run of the town. And before, at one time before I got into the infantry, they had found out I'd taken this uh, swimming training. And so I, they had needed lifeguards at a recreation center on the Mediterranean. So I was assigned as a lifeguard at this place called Monacatini uh, de la Grosseta, which is, Monacatini was, was a town and Grosseta was out on the sea. So I was out there as a lifeguard and while we were there, we were assigned to the Red Cross girls that were in the canteen for rations and the MPs for barracks. So we got acquainted at night, we'd get around and talk to all these girls. So 
when when I was in there and at, with this wound, I went down and I run into one of the girls that I had known in this when I was a lifeguard. So I had, had quite a time there. So after I'd been there about two weeks, I guess, the doc looked at me and said, oh, hell, he said, you, you're well up enough to go back to duty. He said, now, wait a minute. He said, let me look at that chart again. He said, no, nah. he said, that bone hasn't healed yet. He said, you stay here another week. So I was there about three or four days, and they, so then they sent me back to my outfit. In the meantime, the outfit had moved, and we were, they were up in the process of going across through the, the Po Valley. And I was in our outfit. Uh, at that time, the, the tanks, uh, the American tanks, had gone into like battle groups. And they went in ahead and with a few infantry people with them in half tracks and swept through the country and would take, try to surround the, the Germans. In the, and, and our section was mop-up crew. We had to come walk through this country by ourselves. And we were walking through this and of course we were way behind because you're going through vineyards and all what have you, you know, tired. And, and they'd give you uh, rations in the morning. And when you get up, you get your rations for the day, three cans of sea rations. And, and I got sea rations hash and it went off in the brush. I wouldn't carry it. And I got the. Uh, as we were going along, we ran into some of the Italians, and they were kind of glad to see us coming along. The Germans hadn't been very nice to the farmers. And this woman come along, and she gave me a fresh egg. And that was all, well, I mean, that's just like, like eating honey, you know what I mean? So I put it in my coat pocket. In my jet, and so pretty soon we got on up. And we got so far behind that they sent trucks back from the bivouac area that the tank that this headquarters had set up to pick us up and get us into the bivouac area for night so we wouldn't be out there running around in the dark. And I, w I was in a machine gun company and, and our machine gun and mortars were on a trailer behind a jeep. So I was in the jeep to be with, with my machine gun, and we were driving along. It was getting dark, and and all of a sudden the convoy stopped up ahead of us, and I hollered at the jeep driver. I said, "God damn it! Don't bunch up. Stop back here and leave space." And he kept right on driving. He went right up to the bumper of the truck ahead of us. There they were, all these trucks, just bumper to bumper. And a machine gun opened up out in the field. And because they were trucks and G, full of GIs, they went over my head. And I bailed out of that truck. And I, so they finally kind of got things calmed down. And there was a big house at the corner. And we were going on the top of canals. And there was like the, the berms, the road was around the top. They come on. It was a 90 degree in this, in this uh, canal, like as I say, you know, it's like a built up road. And I, I'm up there, we'd got gathered up there and an officer come around and he said, what, what outfit are, and uh, I said who I was and, uh, and uh, what are you with? And I said, well, I was with the weapons, with the weapons division. And, he said, oh, he said, you got machine guns? I said, yeah, they're on the Jeep and uh, mortars. He said, well, look, he said, you go down there and set up down there at, the, at that corner. So I, I said, OK. So I went up to up towards the Jeep. And on the way up there, I, I ran into another officer. And, and he said, oh, he said, you got mortars? He said, we want to set up a mortar over here and fire at that corner. Oh, I said, thanks a lot. So I found a culvert to hide in.
So anyway, everything finally calmed down. A, a German tank showed up, running around out there in the field by itself. So we got all gathered up, got trucks that were still running and, and started back to the bivouac area. And, and I got on my Jeep. And we started down the road and all of a sudden we come to a screeching halt. And you could hear this big roar. And somebody hollered, it's a tank. And I listened, I said, yeah, it's one of ours. No, it can't be. And I said, yeah, it's one of ours. How do you know? I said, I can tell by the sound of it. I said, they don't sound like a German tank. So an officer said, well, maybe you're right. So he radioed down to the CP and they said, no, they didn't have any tanks. All their tanks were bedded down for the night. So I said, oh. I said, okay, but I said, I'll bet you that that's. So we started out again and First thing you know, we're looking down at the muzzle of a big gun. <laughs> and what we had run into was a tank destroyer. And a tank destroyer is built on the chassis of a, of a Sherman tank. So they have the same engines, the same sound, the same tracks, and all the rest of it. I'm sitting there, and this guy squares away, and, and he lets go with that 105 millimeter howitzer on that tank destroyer and he hits the side of that German tank or wow and the tank rolls off and this gunner starts cussing I said what's the matter he said oh he said they were cleaning out the ammunition in my deck last night and he said they mixed my ammunition up he said I hit that guy with a high explosive shell instead of an armor piercing shell so he said, I didn't do any damage. But anyway, we, we get back to camp, and I look, and I've still got this raw egg in my pocket. So I had boiled egg for breakfast. Didn't even smash it. Wow. But we went out of, out of there, and when I got, got up, to the, up to one of the officers, he said, uh, you know, he said, after you went back to the hospital, he says, we got your orders to go back to the States, but you were transferred to the hospital, so we had to send them back, cancel them out. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> I missed it by an hour. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we were going, uh, marching out through the countryside, and we were going down this road, and there was a Oh, like a little bridge with a concrete railing alongside of it. And I just stepped from the road onto the bridge when a shell, German shell hit behind me and it just tore up that pavement behind me. And I'm sitting there with this concrete abutment catching the shrapnel instead of me. And so I say there was another time I was lucky. So you definitely had a rabbit's foot with you. Yeah. So did did you did did you lose many people from your uh not not well I was we lost uh I only saw one man shot. Uh well I say maybe two. Uh after that we were uh we went on through and we went up along Lake Garda which is a big long lake in northern Italy. And uh, the road there, there, it's all like the Alps, and so there's a lot of tunnels. The road went through four or five tunnels. And uh, because we were mountain infantry, we had to go up on the hill trying to go over the top and cut off the road on the other side. And uh, so, but uh, I mean, other than that, we were up on the top, looking down, and, there were, and one guy was, screamed, and he'd been hit. He went falling over. But, and then uh, at night, we were moving around, and there was a kid wounded on a stretcher, and, and the aid people were trying to recruit somebody to help them carry him. 
And, but I'm, I mean, we weren't allowed to just take off here. So that was the only one I ever saw that was wounded after I got mine. Incidentally, I got a Purple Heart for that. I was always saying, now I got the Purple Heart for going after a bottle of beer. But uh, we, shortly after, we were up on top of this hill and, and uh, the Germans were down below us and they were firing at us with anti-aircraft guns. And they were either hitting the hill below us or going over the top of us. I happened to be in a fortunate spot of the hill. But uh, there were quite a few uh, got shrapnel in that that were in the wrong area. But uh, the, the reason I was in the 10th Mountain, they lost a lot of people at the beginning because they didn't have any experience. They didn't know what they were doing. And those of us that went in from, been over there for two years, had a little better savvy to what was going on. Huh. But uh, one night I was put on guard duty after we we got down into taking the town and we got down into town we went up this road and I was on guard duty at the bridge and there was nothing between where we were and the Germans. It was either us or German. And we're, uh, there was uh, myself and, a, and a, another rifleman and uh, all of a sudden, we here come this jeep down the road with the headlights on. What the hell's going on? A big fly, white flag flying on the top of it. And we, so we went out and stopped this guy. And uh, so he and I both, and, and uh, this voice says, do you know who I am? No, sir, we don't know who you are. Well, I'm General so-and-so. And he said, now look, he said, uh, he says, I'm going on up. He says, we got a, a conference with the German officers up this road. He said, I'm a, we're going up here. And he said, I hope to be back in about an hour. He says, when I come back, I hope I've got good news. Sure enough, he was back in about an hour and he stopped. He says, boy, he said, I got good news for you. The Germans in Italy just surrendered. Uh, while we were in northern Italy going through there, we stopped in, in one spot and the, there was a, a gang there and there was a tripod set up with a big bar across the top of it and two people hung up by their heels, their heads down, and one of them was Mussolini and the other one was his mistress. They had tried to get out, the Germans had tried to take them out, and the partisans had found out what part of the convoy they were in and captured them, and they took care of their, they, they weren't very friendly with their head leaders. Wow. So then we, we got, after, we, after the Germans surrendered Italy, we set up a camp and we were moved up in the hills towards Yugoslavia because Tito was kind of kicking up his heels and, and so we were kind of went up there to tell him to behave himself. <laughs> and while I was up there, uh, I was sitting there playing pinochle with the guys one day and, and the officer come down and he said, oh, he said, we got you on a blue ticket to go home. Oh, I said, good. Yeah, he said, you're going to fly home. He said, uh, you'll be home by the end of the week. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I went ahead and played pinnacle. He says, aren't you going to get ready, get your stuff packed? I said, hell, you can have everything I got here. And then I said, I'll believe it when I see it. And I went ahead and played cards. But sure enough, it wasn't long till the trucks come along to pick us up, took us in the wrong direction, and then turned around and took us right back again, led us out in the middle of a field and swampy area, and I thought, yeah, this will be where we sleep, middle of the damn night. Pretty soon he said, load up, and so we got back in the trucks again, drove the rest of the night. We pulled into this 
uh, off the road into a, a hay field. And so they unloaded us and, and they had way over on the other side of the field was a, a brown tent set up and, and they told us to, to go over there and congregate by the tent and it was a Red Cross tent and they were serving coffee and donuts. So we got over there and one of the girls said, oh, he said, you're lucky, you're going to fly home. And I said, yeah, I'll see it. <laughs> but we're detached from our outfit now, we're just a whole bunch of different people, different, different organizations, different outfits. And sure enough, about an hour later, I saw a, a C-47 come in, land on the field, and by the time he got landed, the sky was black with them. So being uh, Bergman, I was one of the first ones out. So we got on a plane, got, got out of there, and, and uh, so we flew over Rome and landed in Capitachina Airport in Naples. And when we landed there, I knew it because we'd had a searchlight set up at Capitachina when I was in Naples. And he, uh, I, I said, this kid come along and cut, got out of the airplane. I said, well, what do we stop here for to get, get gas or something? He says, don't you know where you're going? And it was the pilot. And I said, no. He said, you're going to the replacement depot. I said, I thought that's, that sounds more like the Army. <laughs> so. We went down to the replacement depot in, in Naples, so we were there for, oh, almost two months, I guess. I couldn't be home by the end of the week. So we're sitting there waiting for a ship, and, and uh, finally, one day we got orders, I got orders to move, and they loaded us in a B-17. They'd stripped all the guns out of it, and they put 20 of us in, a, crowded us back in where the bomb bays were, and we landed out of Casablanca and got an airfield there just outside of Casablanca, and they had C-54s. They had a whole raft of them lined up there, every one jacked up and no wheels on it. And so we found out that the they were having trouble with blowing tires and Goodyear was on strike and they didn't have any tires for these airplanes. So when one had come in, they'd blow a tire, they'd take the good tires off of that one and put on another airplane. Well, we'd been there four days and hot, dry, and we'd go in, they had showers and that was good to get a shower. And I used to just go into the shower with my underwear and just wash and wash my underwear and I'd hang it up on the rack and by the time I got through shower it would be dry. The air was so dry. Uh, that hot wind off the desert, that Sirocco wind. But anyway, we got ready to go. Uh, uh, they loaded us up into a, one of those big airplanes and the pilot said, now look fellas, he says, we're having trouble with getting off this field. He said, what happens? It's so hot here that the, the engines overheat and then we have to stop and come back. So he said, now, you guys buckled up and he says, I'm going to taxi out to the end of the runway and he said, I'm just going to hit the engines once. And he said, then we're going to open wide up and take off. He said, before they get, because he said, if we get flying, there's enough air to cool them. But he said, and I, I looked and there's a big sand dune out there at the end of the runway and I think, you know, that's nice, isn't it? But any, anyway, we made it. So we landed in Descartes and uh, when we got to Descartes, we had time to stop there and had a cup of coffee. And we got into another uh, 54 and headed across the Atlantic. And we were headed for uh, Natel in Brazil. And we just nicely got out. We had a bunch of Air Force people that were on board with us that were going back for leave. 
And they, as soon as we got started, they all unbuckled their seats and found all the good places to stretch out to sleep. And we hadn't any more got started, and, and we got the seatbelt sign came on. And God, they turned that plane every way but loose. And so pretty soon, uh, uh, one of the crew was a steward, so he come staggering down the down the aisle, and he went back to the aft compartment. He come up, back up, and he says, "Anybody here?" <laughs> he threw these sick bags up the up the aisle for the, these guys. And when we landed in Natal, the, the pilot said, "He said, I, I said we thought we'd go around that storm, but we we didn't make it." He said, "That's the roughest trip I've made in the last four years I've been on on this run." And when we got to Natel, being again na with letter B for a name, I got on a, a 47, and it was the last one they had. They didn't know when they were going to get some more to go to up to Miami. We had to make one fuel stop, and I, I'm sitting in that 47, and. and I'm I'm looking down out the window and watching the trees go by. And we so where where was it that you landed? Were you in Miami coming back? Or? Well, uh, after we got out of there, we just took off and all of a sudden there was smoke in the airplane and and we thought, oh hell, what's going to happen now? And and the radio had caught fire in the tail. And so they put that fire out, and we went on, we landed in Miami. And, and, and what, a, what a treat we got there to Miami, and they processed us. And the thing that got me was, uh, they asked me, well, how long were you on the airplane flying back? And, well, we were so-and-so. I said, well, how many meals did you miss? What do you mean, meals we missed? I said, well, you get paid for every meal you missed. I said, God, I said, I ought to have a, a lot of money coming because I missed a lot of meals in the infantry. <laughs> but uh, we were there four days and God, they had this place set up. They had POWs from Germany who were serving the tables. And everybody treated us like kings because we were early coming back. They were still fighting the war when we. Uh, although it was, it was still going on in Europe, but it was uh, still in the, in the Pacific was still red hot. But uh, they put us on a on a troop train and headed us north. And we got up out about Jacksonville, I think, someplace in there, out of Miami. And there were two cars of us. They were in. I don't know, the, the Army had built, had taken these cars and they'd made them, I think they were baggage cars originally, because they had side doors on them. And they had put bunks that folded out from the, and they folded down. Well, you folded the top ones down in the daytime, you sat on the bottom ones. And that night you'd fold them back up. But when we got to, to Jacksonville, they took us off of this troop train our two cars and put us onto a regular passenger train and headed us west. And we did find, uh, we could open the door and sit out our feet out. You know, I mean, it, we ate in the damn dining car. But we stopped in Denver. We had a big layover in Denver. So we talked to somebody in to give us a pass, let's go uptown, because it was going to be there. I know eight hours or something, and then we're going to lay over in Denver. So we walked uptown, and of course we had scruffy uniforms on, you know, MPs that throw us in a can for that. So we went into this bar, three or four of us, and, and had a couple beers. And so got to talking, well, where are you guys from? And, well, we just come back from Africa. Oh, in Italy. And so then, oh gosh. 
got to buy you guys a drink. So some guy starts setting up boilermakers. <laughs> so I, I got smart and I said to the, the waitress, the, the girl there, I said, now look, I says, we got to meet that train at 4.30. So I said, you get us out of here and hit it down the damn street so we don't miss that train. So she said, all right, I'll do that. So she headed us out. So there we go staggering down the sidewalk. And uh, Denver was liquor stores. They had liquor stores. They weren't government stores like ours. So I'm going along and we run into a liquor store and I said, hey, I said, I gotta, I'm going to have to have something tomorrow to feed the dog that bit me last night. Get some hair of the dog, you know. So I stopped in there and, and of course, liquor was hard to get and, and so the guy said, I haven't got much. He gave me something, or I don't know what the, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was a pint, you know, a flat pint. So I put this in my shirt pocket and so I'm, we're walking down the, down the platform, down towards our car and the train and I see these two MPs coming down, so I move over towards the, the train side. They move over that way, so I move over onto the empty track side. They move over. So pretty soon they box me in. They said, where are you going, soldier? He said, what do you got there? And one of them hit this bottle with his nightstick, but it was cheap whiskey, so it, it didn't break the bottle. So there, he's starting to question me about passes and what have you. He, so I holler and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, I got a problem back here. So these guys all turn around and come back. The MP says, are you in those two cars up the front? And says, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> they didn't want any part of those guys coming back. <coughs> so the next morning, of course, I wake up with a headache. And so I thought, oh, so I grab this bottle and I take a swig. And I said, oh, God, that's terrible. Whew, can't drink that stuff. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, the door open, I... I go to throw this bottle out, and one of the other guys had it, and he said, hey, wait a minute, he said, don't throw that away. <laughs> so he grabbed it, he'd chug a lug like this, you know, <laughs> then he spit it out. It was terrible. <laughs> I don't know what it was. But anyway, I, we landed in Fort Lewis, so they're preparing us, getting us all straightened to get out, and going through all the questions and what have you. And so they wanted us to join the reserve. You join the reserve, we'll get you out of here a week early. And I said, you guys got to be kidding if you think we're going to volunteer anymore for this goddamn army. How long do you think I've been in this army? Anyway, four days later, I had my discharge papers. And they put us on a bus and sent us to Seattle sent me to Seattle. I had transportation to Seattle. And I got off the bus and I got down on First Avenue. And at that time, my mother was living on 15th, on 15th Avenue, uh, 15th Avenue West. Uh, so I got a, a number, of, I think it was a 15 bus trolley car, went out to Ballard, a Ballard car. But I'm standing there waiting for the the bus and the, the newspaper headlines. The United States drops huge bomb on Japan. So many thousand TTs, tons of TTNT. And so uh, that was uh, when they bombed Hiroshima. But that was another lucky escape I had that I forgot about. That was, we were in Algiers. And I was looking for for gasoline again, so I'm roaming around the country. And I got down on the uh, kind of on the uh, beside the dock area, near the water, near the bay, but it it wasn't where the wharfs were. But I stopped there, and I I, I hear this whistle and commotion, and a tugboat bringing bringing his ship, the smoke coming out of the out of the hull, and and he, they pushed the ship up and grounded it. It was Liberty ship. And uh, then the tug cast off and took off. 
And there was a whole bunch of crates there, and I'd just been standing up on one of these crates, looking at this mess. I thought, ah, I can't, I got to get back to camp. I got to get out of here. So I went back and got in the truck, and I had no motors, got in the truck, and that ship exploded. And there was a, a big uh, civilian truck going across the other way with, with huge rocks on the back of it. And a piece of that ship come over the hood of my truck and hit one, knocked one of those big rocks off of that truck going across there, a chunk out of the side of the ship. And there was a, uh, uh, a destroyer had been a, uh, going to be a hero, and he pulled up alongside of that burning ship and had his sailors out there trying to put the fire out with their fire crew when the when the ship blew, and it just took the bow of that destroyer and just turned it around. And when I looked up, all I could see was these guys going, hanging onto their hoses going up into the air off of the, when that ammunition ship blew. We, uh, they're gonna kick me out of here. I, I gotta take a break in a second. So I got just one last question. Earlier you told me a little story off camera I wonder if you could relate that story to me again about what your wife was doing and what happened on that on that Christmas over in England with the. the well, <clears throat> the girl's wife told me this story. I mean, I met her long after the war, but uh, the girls sat in a row, and each one monitored its own plane while they were over Germany, and it was Christmas Eve, and this girl had had been monitoring a plane, and that plane had, had sent back that plane number 72 had been shot down in flames. And she knew that the girl sitting next to her, it was her husband's airplane. So they just shoved the ticket down to the end so they wouldn't know a thing about it. Another story she told me is that uh, while they were in England, they had a lot of GIs over there were practice flying in the daytime. And they had to learn how to use Morse code so they'd have to practice while they were in, in their flying time. So they'd get up there and they'd start telling dirty stories over the well, the girls that he, the girls had to monitor these guys, and, and all the time they're flying. Well, they, when these dirty stories would come on, they just kind of bypass that. And but this one girl was a prude, and she'd type everything just the way it came over the set. So the next day there was a bunch of Air Force guys out there, marching up and down the perimeter with rifles over their shoulder. If they found out who the girl was that copied that, they'd, they'd had her marching up and down. But that's just one of those sidelight stories. Well, well, thank you very much. It's, I guess you tied down. We get you unmuddled.